All right, good morning. I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. My name is Stephen Watson. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we are so glad that you are here. If you are visiting with us, uh, we had asked that you would fill out a, a welcome card. Uh, a welcome card just allows us to make sure that we get your information. It's hard to get to know to a church in like one visit. And so what we like to do is whenever we get a welcome card is we like to reach out to you with a, a welcome email that talks more about who we are and what we are about as a church. You can fill those out. You probably handed one when you came in the door, but there's, a, there's an offering box out this way with some more cards. Just drop it in the black box and we'll send you an email this week. Also, um, if you want to, you can also text the welcome card to us by texting CCC guest to 94,000, and that'll take you to the same welcome card, but digitally. Uh, also, happy 4th of July. It's, a, it's, it's, it's 4th of July on the Sunday. So, so glad you made it out here today to, to worship with us. A uh, couple things, uh, 4th of July and baseball do seem to go together. Uh, so what we are going to be doing next Friday is we're just going to go to a ball game together. Uh, we have a minor league team in Round Rock called the Round Rock Express. If you're old enough to remember the name Nolan Ryan, he's one of the owners there and the greatest picture of, of all time. Uh, but anyways, we're going to meet out there and just go to the game together. We're going to meet at the field. Um, I know you're thinking, Stephen, it's It's July. But it's a great stadium. I've never been hot there. Uh, but we're going to sit in the left field lawn, which is in the outfield behind third base. Um, the tickets are like $16 a pop. They went up. Uh, but we do have a group discount. If you want the group discount, you can email Corinne at office at Christ.community. And they are essentially like $8, $9 off. So they're $10 each, essentially. Uh, so that, that, that does take the price down a good bit. Uh, but we'd love to see you out there. We do that because being a part of a church community means you have to be in community, which means we need FaceTime, which means we need long innings in which to, like, small talk and get to know each other. And so that's why we do things like that. Uh, on the next morning, so we're going to sit up late Friday night at the baseball game. We're going to wake up early the next morning uh, because... because uh, why not, right? It's only, it's only sleep. Uh, and we're going to do a work day up at the church house. Uh, the project is moving along. Uh, they just polished the sanctuary floor. They're going to bring material to put the sprinkler in system this week. We have this massive driveway uh, that they put in for the fire truck to be able to turn around behind the building and all that jazz. Uh, so we're going to go in next Saturday and do some things that we can do. We'll be painting. We'll be putting hardware in to cabinet doors, sanding some things that need to be sanded. Uh, so if you would like to, we'll be there from 8 o'clock to noon next Saturday across the street on 111 Mountain Lion. Uh, we have a members meeting later on this summer. I can't remember the date or even if it's set, but we believe in our church in what we call a, a covenant membership, which basically means you can have this decision of if I want to be a part of this church community. Uh, Essentially, whenever we look at church membership, what we're saying is that every member is a minister and every member is a missionary. So every member is a minister means if you're a member at Christ Community Church, the other members of this community are looking at you saying, I'm responsible for them. And when you're joining the church, you look at all the other members and you say, I'm responsible for all of them. And we are living with one another. We are serving with one another. We are caring for one another. And so we do that, and that's what we call covenant membership. And so if you would like to become a covenant member, uh, we do vote new members in at those meetings. Um, but we do have a process. So if you would like to be a part of that process, become a member, uh, you can reach out to me. You can talk to me. You can email me at stephen at christ.community. Uh, it is dot .community, not dot .org, not dot .com. Lowe's and Home Depot won't recognize that, but it's dot .community. All right, let's go ahead and stand for our call to worship. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1, says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run the race of endurance, the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. All right, let's worship. 
worship together. Before the world was made. Before the world was made. Before you spoke it to be. You were the king of kings. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. And now you're reigning still. Enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Man, you guys are rambunctious this morning, I love it. Let's sing loudly to our God. All right, Creator God. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God. Glory to God. God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. So take my life, take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be all. for you and for your glory take my life and let it be yours glory to God glory to God glory to God forever glory to God glory to God glory to God forever Deserving, 
I found my treasure, my pleasure in thee. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto I have no merit to woo or delight thee. I have no wisdom or powers to employ. Yet in thy mercy how pleasing thou finds me. This is my that thou art my joy. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy The greatest provision our Father gives us is His grace and forgiveness. Amen. Psalm 94, 18 says, If I say my foot is slipping, your faithful love will support me, Lord. 
Christ Community Church, we have this opportunity each week for us to confess the ways we slip, the ways we stumble to a holy and righteous God who promises here that his faithful love, his has said love will support you, will keep you from falling. Amen. And so each week we get the opportunity to confess these things to him. And so I want to encourage you to spend the next few moments considering your heart, considering the ways you have been slipping and to cry out to a God who will support you. Do that now. The psalmist continues in verse 19 saying, When I am filled with cares, your comfort brings me joy. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are filled with cares. There are times where we feel like we are walking on ice, slipping and stumbling, frustrated, troubled. Lord, but you tell us that you support us, that you comfort us. And I pray that when we bring our sins to you, when we confess them to you and you promise to forgive us of those things, Lord, that let it be a comfort to our weary souls. Let it be the supports we need to stand. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. We thank you for the provision of grace in our lives. We celebrate the union that you have made with us. It's in your name we pray and agree. Amen. Christ Community Church, based on the work, the finished work of Christ, when we confess our sins to him, you can be assured of your forgiveness. Amen. We continue on uh, celebrating this reality of salvation that we have in Jesus at the Lord's table. We get to celebrate the union that Christ has bought on our behalf and joined us with him and each week we get to corporately celebrate that on the night that jesus was betrayed he took the disciples into the upper room and they had the passover meal where he took bread he blessed it and he broke it telling us this is his body which has been broken for you in the same way he took the cup raised it and blessed it said this cup represents a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Paul tells us later in 1 Corinthians that as long as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim him coming again. And so now is the time in our service where we get to celebrate this union with that we have with Christ at the Lord's table. If you are a follower of Jesus, that you trust him, you are walking in repentance of your sins, I'd invite you, whether you're a member here at Christ Community Church or not, to take communion with us, to celebrate this union with us. If you are a a believer who's confessed these things, um, but has found yourself ensnared and stuck without a desire to turn away from your sin, I'd encourage you to abstain from taking the elements this morning and to just ask God to deal with your heart. Because the Lord tells us he will support us. He will comfort us. He will restore us. And so that needs to be our focus, right? If you are here and you are not a follower of Christ, I would encourage you also to abstain from the elements this morning. Just as uh, what, what this act really is, is we are, we are proclaiming our love for Jesus. And so we would never ask you to proclaim your love to something that you don't love. And so don't do that this morning. Consider your hearts and maybe maybe ask the Lord to show you, um, to reveal himself to you in his word this morning. Uh, Pastor Stephen will come up and we'll distribute those elements where we get to celebrate together now.
children can now head out the door for Children's Church. Go ahead and do that now. If you like to follow along, I'll be reading Luke 7, 1 through 10. I'll let you even get there. When he had concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. A centurion servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Rhonda. This passage in Luke chapter 7, there is a phrase, as I read it the first time, that just kept coming back to me time and time again, that, that was just drawn to. Is that phrase found towards the end of the passage, Luke chapter 7. If you go down towards the end in verse 9, Jesus says this, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. Whenever you look at that phrase, you really get a picture about what this passage is about, that this passage is about what great faith looks like. And if you're a person who you're like, man, I just don't know if I have great faith or I know that I don't have great faith, then this passage should be an encouragement to you. Because when you look at this man, the centurion, uh, he didn't fit the profile of someone who should have great faith, does he? The first thing we see is that he's not even a Jew. And he wasn't raised in, in the Jewish way. He didn't go to synagogue school. He didn't memorize the scriptures. He probably didn't know all the stories. But yet here's a man who had great faith. Here was a man who, who was on the wrong side of the war. Don't forget, like he was a Roman centurion ordering around Roman soldiers who had conquered Israel. But yet here was a man who Jesus described, he has great faith, greater than anything he's seen in Israel. So if you're sitting there thinking, man, I know I don't have great faith, or I want more faith in my life, this is a passage that the Holy Spirit put in the Bible for you to be encouraged by. He's saying, this is what great faith looks like. So let's, let's look into that some today. What does it look like to have this great faith? And when we look at this passage and we look at the centurion, we see two different characteristic traits about this man and about what it looks like to have great faith. The first thing we see about him is that he has this great humility. And the second thing that we see about him is he has a great trust. So we want to look at those two things. But before we go there, I feel like I need to spend a little bit of time describing and defining what faith is. Uh, I am such a concrete thinker. I, I don't have an abstract bone in my body. Uh, I, I'm, I'm concrete. And so when I hear words like faith or their sermon is about faith or the text is about faith, I struggle with it because it's not obvious. It's almost this abstract term where we have a hard time grasping it. So let's begin with just talking about what, what is faith. And whenever we're trying to figure things like this out, the place we need to go to is not Google or not Webster Online, but the place we need to go to is Scripture. 
And when you say, well, what does Scripture say about faith? And here's a different, few different passages. You can write these passages around, down, look them up later. I'll read them for you this morning. But what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 2 describes faith, and it defines faith. He says, now faith is reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. That faith, what the author of Hebrews is saying is that faith is the certainty that we have about the things that we cannot see. We can't see God. We can't touch God. We can't smell God. But we have this certainty, this assurance of truth about him that we hold on to. The Bible describes that as faith. I think we see an example of that in, in the person of Abraham. Uh, Abraham is, is oftentimes called the founder of our faith. We read about him in Genesis chapter 12 through much of the rest of the book. And God promised Abraham a great promise. He said, Abraham, I am going to bless the world through you. And though you don't have a child, your descendants are going to be greater than the sands of the seashore. Your descendants are going to be more than the stars in the sky. You won't be able to number them. And that's the promise that God gave to Abraham and Sarah, who were beyond the age of even having children. But the miraculous happened, that God's promise came true, that Abraham and Sarah had a son. They named him Isaac, and all seemed to be going pretty well for about 13 years. And then when young Isaac was 13 years old, a new word of the Lord came to Abraham. This time the word of the Lord said this, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice your son. So Abraham, without question, takes some servants. They load up all the supplies that they'll need. He takes his son, and they go three days out into the journey, into the wilderness. Isaac, who's now 13, is going up this mountain with his dad and says, Dad, we, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have the knife, but what we don't have is we don't have the sacrifice. And Abraham's words to his son was that the Lord will provide. They get to the top of the mountain. Abraham lays his son down on the altar, raises his knife to obey the word of the Lord. And what does the Lord do? The Lord says, stop. What do we see in Abraham? What we see is this picture of faith. What makes it faith? What makes it faith is that Abraham had a promise from God, that God promised Abraham, your descendants through Isaac is going to be more than the sands of the sea, more than the stars of the sky. They can't be numbered. And Abraham believed God's promise so much that somehow he knew, even if I obey the Lord and I take my son's life, somehow the Lord's promises will still come through and my son will live again because he has to have descendants. That's what faith is. A certainty in the promises of God. A certainty that God is good, true, and just and will do what he has said. We can't see God, we can't smell God, we can't taste God, we can't touch God, but we hear his word in scripture and we say, it's true. That's what faith is. Not only is that what faith is, but scripture goes on to teach us more about faith and it tells us that we are actually saved by grace, but the way that we receive God's grace is through faith. This is what it says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast. What is Paul teaching the church in Ephesus? He's saying, listen, you are not saved by being a good person. You are not saved even by faith. Listen to what he says. He says, you are saved by faith grace that is by God's mercy and kindness through the work of Jesus that you are saved. What role does faith play? Faith is like a, a conduit. It's like a channel that the way that God's grace gets from him to us is through faith. That's what faith is. 
It's trusting in God's promises, and that trust is the channel, it's the conduit by which God gets his grace and mercy to us. And unless we start to get proud and say, well, I've got the faith, Scripture then reminds us that even our faith is not our own. Listen to what it says in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 3. For by grace, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. He's like, be humble, people, right? That's what he's saying. Be humble. He said, instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Did you catch that? God has distributed a measure of faith to each one of us. Notice the role that God has in salvation. It is by God's grace that we are saved through the work of Christ. The way that that grace gets from Jesus to us is through the conduit or through the channel of faith. But even that conduit and even that channel of faith is God's gift to us. We can't boast in our works that we saved ourselves. We can't even boast in the faith that we have because the Bible says that that faith is from God. And that faith that God has given to each and every one of us, Scripture tells us that it can grow within us. That the faith that God has given you to believe in Jesus is a faith that can grow. This is what it says in the book of 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, since your faith is flourishing and the love you have for one another is increasing. Did you catch that? He said your faith, this gift of faith that God has given you is flourishing. And some of you might say, well, man, I really wish God had given me a bigger gift. I really wish God had given me more faith so I wouldn't have to struggle, so I wouldn't have to go through this, this doubt that I sometimes faith, face. And I'm reminded of what Christ said in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, that even faith the size of a, size of a mustard seed can move mountains. That it is not the amount of faith that, that you are giving that matters. It's like, are you using the faith that God has given you? Are you walking in the faith that God has given you? That's what matters. Because when you walk in that faith, when you walk in that assurance of the hope of the promises of God, that is when our faith begins to grow and our faith begins to flourish. So what we want to do in our passage in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, is we want to look at this Roman centurion who Jesus said, I have not found a faith this great in all of Israel. We want to look at his faith, faith, and we want to say, what can we look at as far as an example? Whenever we read Scripture, whenever we read the Word of God, one of the questions we always need to ask is, is there any example for me to follow in this text? Because we learn and we are trained by examples. My, uh, my wife, asked, she's always hesitant to ask me to do projects around the house because one of my sayings with projects around the house is nothing's ever easy and everything always grows. And so she's like, I just, she said, Stephen, all I want you to do is, is paint the laundry room. And so, all right, well, if you want me to paint the laundry room, I got to take off the baseboards because I'm not painting those old, ugly baseboards. And if I'm painting the laundry room, the previous owners cut a hole into the sheetrock that's just been there for the last decade, and I need to fix that as well. And what should have taken like three hours is now taken three days. And so this week I've been drywalling. I've been patching the holes that the previous owners have put into my laundry room. And, you know, I've never been trained on how to do that. I never took a class on it. I never watched YouTube on how, how to patch a drywall hole. You know, you know how I learned how to do it? Uh, it looks ugly, but it's, it's not a hole there anymore. But you know how I learned how to do it? I learned how to do it by watching my dad. That over the last 42 years, I would go with my dad on job sites, and I'd watch him patch holes in sheetrock. I learned it from watching Donald Power, who's a member here, And he goes over there to the church house, and he's like a a mud and floating master. And he can combine walls and fix holes, and you never know there's a hole or a joint there. And I watch those guys, 
and I watch them and I try to follow their example. Now, like I said, it looks a bit ugly right now, but I'm trying to walk in their ways. And as I walk in their ways, I will get better at it as time goes by. So we need to look at the examples of Scripture, and we need to follow the example of the people that Scripture holds up, saying, look at this man, look at his great faith, and walk in his ways, follow his path. So what do we see in this centurion? The first thing we see is that he has a strong humility. What is humility? Humility, I think, is sometimes easier defined by the things that it isn't. Humility can be defined by a person who is not arrogant. They are free from pride. They don't think of themselves. They don't walk into a room and they don't think, I'm the most important person here. But they look at themselves with sobriety. They look at other people and their needs and what they need, and they say, I need to serve them. Christ Community Church, as, as a church body, we need to be a humble people. We don't come to church to be served. We come to church to minister to one another. We come to church to serve other people. If you're saying, man, I want to grow in my faith, you know what I would say? Look for a way to serve. Look for a way to minister to other people. That might be in our church service. We have people sitting in our service right now that just served the first service in the nursery and on the hospitality team. We have people this service who served in, in, in reading scripture. But I also know and I hear stories all the time about how you are serving one another in our community outside of church. The service that might be born within the context of the services on Sunday grows and flourishes oftentimes outside the church. I, I sometimes talk with Lindsay, and, and one of the things we've been saying lately about like serving in the nursery is that hospitality begins in the nursery, right? That if we want to be hospitable people, we need to serve one another by watching each other's kids. We need to serve one another by opening up our houses. We need to serve one another by looking at other people's needs, that that is what humility and hospitality is about. And this man, this centurion in Luke chapter 7, was a man who had a strong humility, and we see it in different ways. We first see it in, in chapter 7, verse 2, where it said that this Roman centurion, this man of power, this man of, of position, this man of strength, had a slave or had a servant to whom he loved. Our version that we read out of says it this way. He says, a man who was highly valued by him. When you read many commentaries, they point to not just like highly valued, like he's useful for the centurion, but more that there is a personal affection. Like he's highly valued because I love him and I care for him. In the Roman world, around the world, whenever you have this, this relationship of slave and master, servant and master, typically there's not that bond of affection. But here's a centurion, a man of power, position, stature, looks at his servant who is dying, and he is brokenhearted for him. He longs for it to see him get better, not because of what he can do, because he has affection for him. This is a man who looks at someone who the world holds in low regard, and he has high regard for them. It's humility. We see humility in that though he was a man of position, power, and strength, he didn't make demands. And many times when someone has power, position, and strength, they just like to throw out orders. They like to throw out commands, and they expect everybody to move. Some of you might even have jobs like that where that's how it is. It's your job. You have this positional power and authority, and then you get home, and you start throwing commands out like the same way, and everyone's like, nah, that, that's not going to work here, right? Uh, but that's not who he was. Whenever he looked at Jesus, this man who was homeless, this homeless teacher, Jesus, uh, he did not offer him orders and commands like, hey, Jesus, you need to get over here and, and do my bidding. But what it says in Scripture in verse 3, it says that he, he took some Jewish elders and sent them to request that Jesus comes out. Jesus, would you please come? Would you please 
would you come please help my servant who's dying? He didn't put out an order. He put out a request which shows some of his humility. And then even when Jesus said yes, and Jesus began the journey to the centurion's house, the centurion shows us humility once again and says, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house all the way. He says, I am unworthy to have you come into my house. Whenever we think about our God, do we think of ourselves as unworthy of his grace or of as deserving of his grace? I think sometimes this comes out in the way that we pray. And then we pray our prayers, it's almost like we have this expectation that whenever we pray that God has to jump. And we give demands of, God's in our, of God in our prayers. But I think what humility calls for is us to come before the throne of grace. We can come confidently because of Jesus, but we come to him laying our requests before him, not our demands before him. James says, whenever we're just talking about our days, we don't say, well, this is what I'm going to do, but rather we ought to say everything with this caveat, if this is the will of God. So if you are in the situation that you see no way out of, your prayer isn't, God, fix it. But God, if it be in your will, fix it. If you have something wrong and you're praying that you would get better health-wise, you don't say, God, fix me. You say, God, if it be in your will, fix me. Because we believe, as Paul did, that even if God doesn't answer that prayer, that his grace is sufficient and his power will be made manifest in our weakness. We have to approach God humbly. How do we do that? How do we think about ourselves less? Not thinking less of ourselves, not beating ourselves up, but how do, we, how do we have our attention on God and how do we have our attention on others rather than having all of our attention on us? I think one of the things that we need to do to become humble people is we have to realize everything that has been given to us. When you think about where you are in your life, you have to realize how much has been given to you. You might say, well, I've worked hard. I've earned it. I deserve it. But everything you've worked towards and earned is also still a gift. Think about it in the terms of Moses. Moses, did Moses choose his mother? Moses didn't choose his mother. God chose his mother for him. And it was his mother who said, I'm not going to throw my baby boy into the Nile to be eaten by the alligators and the crocodiles and the hippos, but rather I am going to hold on to my baby boy as long as I can. It wasn't Moses who made the basket that he floated down the river in, was it? But it was his mother. It wasn't Moses who said, you know what? I want to be raised in a palace with Pharaoh. But it was God that directed that basket into the Pharaoh's daughter's camp. Even when you think about what Moses did as an adult, did Moses just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I think I'm going to go free my people? No, that was God's calling on his life. It wasn't through Moses' power and Moses' intellect that he was able to work the ten plagues in Egypt that brought them their freedom. It wasn't his power or his ability whenever he struck the rock and water flowed out of it. It's not like he called for manna from heaven, but it was God who gave that to them. Everything about Moses was a gift from God. And it says in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 12, that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Now, we believe Moses wrote that, so it's a little, little funky there, right? Uh, he wrote that about himself. I just wonder if he, he was like writing that and the Spirit was leading him. was like, oh. Do I have to put that in there, God? All right, all right, okay. Uh, but yeah, Moses was humble because he realized that he wasn't the source of what he had. Did you decide in what age you were going to be born in? I'm going to be born in the 20th or 21st century. You could have been born in the Middle Ages. Did you decide the country that you were going to be born in? No, you didn't. God decided what country you were going to be born in. Did, did you decide your parents? No, you didn't decide your parents. Did you decide the amount of IQ and capacity that your brain could function on? No, God gave you that. 
What about your work ethic? Because you've worked and you earned everything. You don't, you're not, you don't develop your own work ethic. Your work ethic is developed from the experience around you of how your parents raised you and the community that you were raised in. And, 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 and it, it's a social thing. Do you work hard? Yes. Do you get some credit for that? Yes. But so much more has been given to you. Humility begins with an acknowledgement of what God has done and what God has given to us. So, so to be humble people, we have to, to pause and we have to think about it. All right, I'm not all that, right? But so much of who I am and what I have has been given to me by the grace of God. So we realize what has been given to us. And then the second thing to go into this humility, we need to be filled with awe and wonder over the one who has given us everything. We need to be filled with awe and wonder over the one who has given us everything. I uh, was watching this Netflix show. I guess it was on like History Channel first, but it's called Alone in the Arctic. Anyone familiar with it? They'll take a survivalist and they'll drop them off in like northern Canada in October. And they're like, all right, you get to take 10 things with you. You have no supplies. Uh, which of you can make it 100 days? And that's kind of the, the, the show. It's fascinating. I would never eat the things they eat. And I've eaten some pretty crazy things. But I, I don't know if, if the people that they have on the show don't have faith or if through editing they hide their faith. But when I was watching, I was struck by every time like they go out and they trap a rabbit. They'll look at that rabbit and they'll say, thank you, rabbit, for giving your life for me. And I'm thinking, why are you thanking the rabbit? It's not like the rabbit's going to say, you're welcome for like killing me in this noose. Where did that rabbit come from? Well, it was a creation of God. Who put that rabbit in that area where they could then snare it? Well, God placed it there. Who, who gave that survivalist the ability and the knowledge and the know-how to trap that rabbit, to process it, and then to get nutrients from it? That's from God. There's a reason why we thank God for our food. I'm not, I'm not going to say when I get to Chick-fil-A, I'm going to say thank you, Chick-fil-A, for this wonderful fried chicken sandwich. I'm not going to do that. I'm thankful for Chick-fil-A, but I'm thankful that God made them and that God has provided with money to buy that food. But we have to realize that God is the source of all the goodness in our lives, that we have been given so much, and we've been given it to us by God. I think this centurion in Luke chapter 6 was a humble man. He had a strong humility, and that humility exhibited itself in how he lived his life. Think of the trust that he had. He was a man who had a strong humility, but also he had a strong trust. He had trust in God's authority. Think about authority. Authority is essentially power. If someone is in a seat of authority, they have the power to control things around them. They have the power to direct people. They have the power to determine what happens in the order in which it happens. So authority is power. And one of the things we see about the centurion is that the centurion had authority. The centurion had this positional authority, right? He was a centurion. He had Roman soldiers under him. And he was able to give them orders, and they had to obey orders or else. He had positional authority. But we also see that the centurion had a relational authority. The Jews, the civic in the, in the area, the Jews didn't have to listen to him. He, was, he should have been the enemy. But because the way the centurion lived his life and cared for those around him, he had developed this relational authority. So that when he asked the question, hey, will you guys go to Jesus for me? They said, man, we'd love to. And they went with a good recommendation and a good reference saying, Jesus, man, this man is worthy. He knew authority. He, he had authority. But he also knew how authority worked, didn't he? He knew that if he gave an order, people had to follow his orders. So when Jesus was coming to his house, he said, Jesus, I, I understand authority and I get it. And I understand whenever I say go, people go. 
I understand that whenever I say come, people come. I understand when I say do this, they do that. I understand authority. He says, Jesus, I trust your authority. I believe that you're a man of authority, not positional authority, not relational authority. I believe, Jesus, that you have this divine authority, that if you just say the word, what you say will come true. We don't know how the centurion knew about Jesus. It doesn't say that, but he was a centurion. He was the occupying force. So one of the things he had to do is he always had to have his ear to the ground. He always had to know what was happening in Capernaum. So if there was an outbreak or if there was a riot or there was a rebellion, he could, he could squash it, right? So he had reports. And so one day he got a report of Jesus. Here's this young rabbi who's going around teaching with authority that crowds are going to him. People are lining up and being healed. There are people with demons, and he says the word, and the demon leaves. When he heard these reports about Jesus, he began to believe in the authority of Christ. He trusted, he believed that Jesus had this power and authority. How do you know if you believe in somebody's authority? You listen to it. I know as a parent that I've lost authority when I look at my kids and I say, go and do this. And they're like, yeah, no. I mean, there's going to be consequences. But I've lost authority because they're not listening. They're not obeying me. That evidence that you trust somebody's authority means that when you hear their word, when you hear their command, that we follow through with it. If you're saying, how do I grow in my faith? You need to have this strong humility, thanking God for what he has given to you. And, and, and you also have to have this strong trust so that whenever we hear the word of the Lord, that we are moved by it. We're trusting in the authority of God, but we're also trusting his word. When we look at the centurion, what he said to Jesus, he said in verse seven, but say the word and it will go through. Say the word and my servant will be healed. He trusted not only the authority of Christ, but he trusted in the word of Christ that when God says something, then it is, it is as good as done. That whenever he says be healed, they're healed. When he says, be raised from the dead, they're raised from the dead. Whenever he says, demon, be cast out, they're cast out. When he says, let there be light, there is light. That the word of God is tied to the authority of God. And when God says something, it is going to come to pass. How much are we listening to God's word? Because we have to admit and we have to confess, and we have to praise God that he has not left us silent. We have God's word, don't we? That's what we believe the Bible to be. One of my favorite quotes about the Bible, I can't remember if it was Wayne Grudem or R.C. Sproul. I can't remember who said it, or even if they said it first. I don't know, but it's not mine. But they said, to disbelieve the Bible is to disbelieve God. And to disobey the Bible is to disobey God. That the Bible is God's word. And if we are going to have great faith, if we're going to be people of great faith, we need to have this strong, this strong humility, but we have to have this strong trust that his word is true. And that regardless of what it says and how hard it is to believe, we have to follow in faith to obey it. We live in a society and we live in a culture that is changing a lot and one of the ways that it has changed much in the last decade or so is that the way that the Bible is viewed is differently. That it no longer has the high regard of society, but that when people look at the Bible, they look at it and they say, well, this word, this Bible is flawed or it's filled with errors or that it can't be trusted or that it's archaic or backwards. And they look at it and it's the rejection of it. But as followers of Christ, that is not how we view the Bible. We look at this word and we say, man, this, this, is a, this, is, this is a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. We're going to trust it 
and we're going to follow it. And whenever I don't understand it or I disagree with it, I'm just going to have the general assumption that I'm wrong and it's right. Too often in our lives, we say, you know what? I am going to read the Bible so that it conforms to me. But what God is calling us to do is to read the Bible and we need to conform to it. If we want to have a great faith, then we have to trust and have a strong trust in God's authority and in God's word. Are we going to be more formed by God's word or are we going to be more formed by the world around us? When was the last time when you read an article, heard a news report, watched a movie or a show, and you asked the question, well, what does God's word say about that? I think as followers of Christ, that's, that's, that question ought to be on the tip of our tongue and coming off of our lips all the time. But what does the word of God say about that? We live in a world where, where the culture is turning and the culture is trying to reproduce itself. And so if we want to step out of our culture and say, I want to bend the knee to Christ and not to where our culture is and where our culture is going, we have to bend the knee to Christ and we have to listen to his word. But that means that we are formed to it rather than being formed to the world. If we want to grow in our faith, we need to have this strong humility looking at ourselves soberly, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We trust in Christ our Savior. We believe that he is a giver of all good gifts, but we also are trusting his authority and his word. Abraham trusts the promises of God so much so that whenever the word of God said to sacrifice your son, he said, I'm going to sacrifice my son. We, too, have promises from God, promises of salvation, promises of eternity, promises that Christ will never leave us or forsake us. Are we walking in that same faith? Is our faith flourishing in the same way? Because it's possible when we submit to our God and to his word. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, thank you for, we thank you for your word, for the truth, the beauty, the goodness in it. We thank you that it paints a clear picture of who you are, of how you are the giver of every good gift. Help us, O oh Lord, to acknowledge your goodness, to walk humbly with you. Help us, O oh Lord, to conform our lives to, to your way and to have our faith flourish, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to end uh, this morning singing Psalm 113. Uh, there's a lot of people that have joined our church since we last talked about it. We use some songs out of uh, what's called the Psalter. So we take common hymn tunes and we put the words of Scripture to them. So this is uh, Psalm 113 with the tune of Come Now Long Expected Jesus. So if you don't know the words yet, then get the tune and we'll have it down. All right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. Praise, O oh servants of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord's name forever. Praise Him now and evermore. From the rising of the sun, to where it sets at end of day the Lord's name is to be praised in every place the sun has swayed All right, for the Lord is high above for the Lord Oh
throne on high, he who stoops to look upon all on the earth from heaven high. He does raise the poor from dust, lifts me ones from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and with princes he their lives will be. He will give the barren woman joy in children all her days. In a home Christ Community Church. Remember, uh, typically we're doing popsicles at the park throughout the summer as a way to build community and also do outreach to our community. Today's July the 4th, and so we're not going to be doing that today. Uh, instead, uh, accept one of those invitations to go to a barbecue, have people over, uh, talk about the goodness of our God, share the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, and talk about his freedom that we have in, in him. Uh, let's go ahead and remain standing for our benediction. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been given every good gift from God the Father. Let us celebrate his name, thank him for his kindness and his faithfulness, and let us then trust his authority and word and see our faith flourish. You are dismissed. <laughs>